We can now introduce Steve Phelps, who is our speaker today. He has a bachelor's degree both in philosophy and in physics. His two loves, which have continued to this day, um, these were degrees from uh, Stanford, and he went, went on and got a PhD in physics from Princeton, specializing in cosmology. He served at the World Center in the research department for 13 years, where he was involved in collating and indexing the writings of Baha'u'llah uh, and the Bab, and at the same time was also uh, had, had a position at the Technion uh, University in Haifa in physics, where he was continuing to do research on the masses of nearby galaxies, so he was continuing his cosmological interests. And I'm sure he's keeping up with the literature of that uh, even now. Um, I, it's the sort of thing you would never want to give up on. And he currently lives in the Portland, Oregon area with his wife and his three daughters. So, Steve, welcome to the Wilman Institute's Web Talks. We're delighted to have you. And we will now turn everything over to you. So if you could start sharing your screen with our audience, you can get started. Great. Thanks, Rob. And thanks for everyone who has tuned in. So welcome, everybody. This talk that I'll be giving is really a um, continuation. I think of it as a continuation from the talk uh, that I gave back in August on the writings of the Bob. Uh, and you'll see why probably in a few slides. There's 14 slides. I hope to get through them in plenty of time to take questions, um, although there is a, a fair bit of material to get through. Uh, the background for this presentation is the presentation I gave back in August on the writings of the Bob. Uh, and the URL is there on the screen. This time we'll be looking at the writings of Baha'u'llah. As we know, Baha'u'llah has described his revelation as, a, as an ocean in which are concealed pearls of, uh, of surpassing luster and immeasurable price. And, uh, but what we, we will also be doing is completing uh, the trilogy of the central figures by including in, uh, in the ambit of our conversation today the writings of Abdu'l Baha. We'll be addressing two primary challenges as we were in the last uh, in our last presentation. The first is that of access. Uh, what is actually out there? Um, and when I ask that question, I really mean beyond the, the published writings uh, that we, uh, for in many cases for many decades or uh, close to a century, have already had access to in English translation. Uh, and in terms of the metaphor of the ocean, that really boils down to charting the coastline. Uh, and the second question I'll be addressing is content. Uh, what do they say? Uh, and, and there we're, we're talking about plumbing the depths and bringing up some pearls, uh, or at least uh, going on a, a snorkeling expedition to skim beneath the surface. So challenges on the path of approach to the ranks of, of Baha'u'llah, in terms of access, first of all, both the original texts uh, and the translations uh, still exist in a, in a scattered uh, an uncoordinated, uncodified sense. Um, and I mean beyond if, if you're not sitting at, at, at a chair in the research department or the, or the archives uh, in Haifa. And this really contrasts to the situation with uh, any, any of the other uh, world faiths that for which their sacred scriptures have been codified into a single text. They exist between the covers of a single book or a very well-defined uh, series of books. Um, in our case, uh, the, the, the writings still, in some cases, have yet to be gathered together in the original languages, uh, let alone translated, let alone codified into, uh, into formal series of, of volumes. Uh, the majority of these original texts uh, are, are in Arabic. I'm, I'm talking here particularly about the writings of Baha'u'llah, and the far majority are, are untranslated. For those who want to engage in an exhaustive and systematic study of them, uh, one of the initial questions that's very difficult to answer, uh, particularly, well, whether you're an English, a reader in the English or in Persian Arabic is, where do they begin and where do they end? Uh, and, and where can I find them? So we'll be trying uh, to, to approach an answer to that, to the, a partial answer to that question today. And the second question is that of content. The, the size of, of this ocean, of this most great ocean for Baha'u'llah's writings around six million year, uh, words, as we discussed in the last a webinar around 5 million words for the Bob and around 20,000 surviving works of Baha'u'llah. The uncharted vastness of this ocean uh, can tend to discourage the approach. So we look for touch points um, or uh, overall schemas that might help us navigate that ocean. So the goal for today will, will be to 
uh, to present two aids for the advanced study of the of the Baha'i writings, and the first of which will facilitate access by cataloging the accessible sources, listing exhaustively uh, or attempt attempting to list exhaust exhaustively what we presently have access to, uh, both in the original text and in the translations. Although I should note that the real focus of, of, of this work is more on the original text than on the translations, although all the translations that I could find have been included in this as well. But those who have access to the, to the Persian Arabic will particularly benefit from, from this work. Uh, the, the method I use in, in bringing together and collating them is the same method that I described in the last webinar, uh, using basically a big spreadsheet and several hundred lines of, of VBA code that we really don't want to get into. Um, and uh, and the, uh, as I mentioned, the, the circumference of this study is going to include uh, all three central figures, uh, actually, but we'll, we'll perhaps be focusing on the writings of, of Baha'u'llah today. Secondly, we'll be exploring content by looking at, uh, in particular, a thematic reconstruction of these writings, acknowledging that multiple approaches are possible. Um, I should say at the beginning, sort of word of, of, of warning to the, to the reader, that, that what I'm presenting is not an introduction to, to the writings. Uh, familiarity with the central figures and their principal works is assumed. Um, really, uh, I, I imagine the, uh, a sequence of steps that one would take uh, would be first to get one's bearings before heading out un into these uncharted waters. And, and getting one's bearings uh, could mean a combination of uh, either you know, taking the sequence of Ruhi courses and or reading the available published literature uh, at Baha'i.org slash library, which, which is where we have uh, very neatly organized for us the, the majority of what has been translated and made available in English, but certainly not the totality. Uh, and that's where we come to the to the third part, which is heading out into these uncharted waters uh, of the revelation. Um, and as the medieval map makers uh, would put dragons and whirlpools on the on the edges of the map, which are unknown, uh, in a similar sense, uh, the 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 dragons that we may encounter as we head into uncharted waters are dragons which may uh, consume our old ways of thinking about things. One never leaves on a long sea voyage without being changed in some way. So the primary sources for this inventory of Baha'u'llah's writings are, uh, if we look at what we had up until this point by way of a list of what Baha'u'llah has revealed, uh, probably most of us would point to a list that appeared almost, uh, almost incidentally in the appendices of the old Baha'i world volumes. I say incidentally because no real attention was ever drawn to it, uh, but for those who, who saw it and, and were captivated by it, it gave you at least an initial glimpse of, uh, at least uh, by listing the titles of those uh, well-known works of Baha'u'llah that for the most part we did not yet have access to uh, in English and still do not do not have access to. But there were only around 150 items uh, on that list for Baha'u'llah's writings. There were also a uh, list for the Bob's and Abdu'l-Bahá's writings in those same appendices, uh, which, were, uh, which were substantially shorter. Uh, in, in more recent times, uh, on the internet, uh, there uh, you may be aware of something called the Leiden List, which cataloged around 500 works of Baha'u'llah, but still that's only around 2.5% of the total, uh, and that list hasn't been updated for, for, for more than 10 years. So the core resources that we will use in trying to bring together a more complete list are first and foremost the Baha'i Reference Library, which probably most of the people on this webinar are already familiar with and which in recent years has also become a place for, uh, for new translations that otherwise don't appear in, uh, in print publications uh, to be released to, uh, to, uh, to the world. So it's a very valuable and really the core resource, I would say, because it's only uh, those texts, both original and in translation, that are here at the Baha'i Reference Library that we can say uh, we have you know, virtual 100% certainty of the authenticity and correctness of all the texts that appear on that website. But if we go beyond that, we find um, this is where we start to uh, to gather together those raw the, those raw materials that we can that we can uh, create this more comprehensive catalog from. First of all, I would mention the Iranian National Baha'i Archives volumes, which are all in Arabic and, and Persian. There's over a hundred of them. Uh, they had circulated informally for many years until being digitally scanned and made available publicly at the Afnon Library, which physically exists in England, 
uh, but now exists also in internet form. The British Library, it turns out, also contains quite a large uh, repository of the writings of Baha'u'llah, more than half of them uh, by, by item count. There are miscellaneous publications uh, scanned and digitized in Arabic, uh, Persian, and English uh, in various places on the internet. I should mention a website I really stumbled across a few months ago called Baha'ilib.com, which contains over a thousand scanned texts. Again, these are in Persian and Arabic. There are also miscellaneous publications still in paper form, uh, so the internet uh, does not yet contain all of what has uh, been at some point published in paper form. And then besides that, there's internet original content, miscellaneous websites uh, such as Baha'ilibrary.com, which has done a wonderful job over the last really couple of decades of bringing together um, other more out-of-the-way corners of sources uh, including provisional translations and, and pilgrim notes uh, and so forth, and this is all in English. And beyond that, there's a, a, a penumbra of personal websites and blogs and, and other resources, uh, which all fed into this process of inventory that I'll be presenting the results of today. The results of this inventory, if we look at availability, and this was mentioned previously in relation to the writings of the Bob, around 25% of the writings of the Bob by word count, it turns out are accessible and available in the public domain in the original languages. That number for Baha'u'llah's writings is much higher, around 75% of that known total of around 6 million words. Uh, so that's around 44.5 million words of Baha'u'llah's revelation are accessible in the public domain. Uh, not necessarily easily accessible, but, uh, but they are accessible. And the number for Abdu'l Baha's total writings also, which is around five or six million words, is is forty percent. So, if we look at the at the coverage of the present inventory um, by item count, uh, you, we've seen the numbers previously for the Bob, and we now have comparable numbers for Baha'u'llah and Abdu'l Baha. Where by item count, it's it's more or less half, or for Baha'u'llah, less than half for Abdu'l Baha. Uh, for word count, it's as I mentioned around three quarters for Baha'u'llah, and again, less than half for Abdu'l Baha. All told, we can still say that what we have available in the public domain is substantially less than half of the known total, taking all three central figures of the faith together. To this, uh, we will add reported utterances um, as, a, as, as a kind of a bonus section. Uh, and there's a few thousand of those, mostly from Abdu'l Baha. So to access the inventory, uh, it is currently up and available at the following website, blog.loomofreality.org. And you can actually uh, follow along if you, if you wish as you're listening to this webinar, you can go to this website now and download a copy of it. Uh, it's, a, it's a PDF file around 50 megabytes. And, uh, and that's the title page down there. So let me switch over uh, and, and introduce this document, which will be the, the tool we'll use, our navigational tool, as we, uh, as we explore these, these uncharted waters. The uh, table of contents uh, will introduce you to what's there. We have catalogs for each of the central figures, the writings of Baha'u'llah, the Bab, and Abdu'l Baha. There's, uh, for the sake of, uh, of trying to save space, uh, these catalog entries are highly compressed, and so source codes are used. The whole thing is, is coded to use the smallest number of characters, uh, just uh, to give uh, a, an example of one of the pages of this catalog. Um, it just, it, it's a lot of three and four letter abbreviations primarily. Um, as I had introduced this catalog for the writings of the Bob previously, uh, it was pure text, uh, but now the catalog has been enhanced through use of tens of thousands of hyperlinks. So all of these hyperlinks are clickable. Uh, so when you, when you see the, the, these lists of, of all the different directions you can go on the internet where you can find versions of this item of, uh, of Abdu'l Baha's, these are all uh, live clickable hyperlinks. So that is uh, a, a glimpse of what the, the catalog pages look at, and, um, and the catalog is well over a, a thousand pages long. The key to those catalog entries are, is the bibliography, which gives you 
the uh, the source codes, and it, it tells you what's behind the source code, and also gives you a link to the to the full text when available. Uh, fortunately, full text were available for most of these documents somewhere on the internet, uh, but there are still many cases where the document exists but uh, not yet in scanned form on the on the internet. So let me go back to the title page and show you a few other features of this um, before going taking a, a more deep dive into the um, into one of the catalog entries itself. Uh, apart from the um, apart from the uh, let's see if I can find the table of contents again from the catalogs and the bibliography which gives you the key to the sources, there are a series of indexes, uh, indexes to the source references, indexes of the first lines, which will be mainly of use to those who are trying to identify texts in the original Persian and Arabic, uh, index of titles, uh, such as those from Shoghi Effendi's well-known works list, and index of questions, which is, I think, one of the more fun, fun sections, uh, because you get to see the, the questions that people asked, uh, primarily of Abdu'l Baha, um, and, uh, and, and because of the internal series of, of hyperlinks, uh, you can click on any of these, and it takes you right to the uh, to the catalog entry that, that can give you the answer, uh, or at least the answer as, as reported uh, by those who, uh, who were around Abdu'l Baha at the time. Uh, somehow this manages to skip the table of contents. After the index uh, are a couple of appendices, which I'll deal with towards the end of this, of this webinar. But I want to get back and talk a little bit more about each index entry, because understanding these index entries is key to being able to navigate this, this catalog. And the sample index entry I have here is the uh, Kitab Akdas, which is the first item in the catalog. First of all, I should mention there is an ID numbering scheme, which helps to orient and, and answer the question, where does it begin and where does it end? Uh, until you have a unique ID number associated with each item, uh, uh, each work of the central figures, you, you don't know where you're starting and where you're ending. And so these ID numbers were assigned, of, of course, provisionally, uh, primarily in rank order of word count, although exceptions were made for works that are universally regarded as, as preeminent. So Baha'u'llah Kitabi Akdas, although not his longest work, ends up being assigned the ID number BH1, BH for Baha'u'llah, BB for the Bab, and AB for Abdu'l Baha. So these ID numbers all begin with two letter abbreviations and are followed by a five digit number, which is roughly in order of, of word count. The Kitabi Akdas was assigned the, the first position, um, and each catalog entry contains a, a title if, if it exists, uh, the word count, uh, estimated word count. Again, if, if we know what it is, in the vast majority of cases we do know, there are a few cases where we know the existence of a work but not its word count. The language it was written in, the first line in Arabic and Persian. Again, there are many cases where we where we have a translation, but we don't have the original text, at least not accessible in the public domain. So in some cases, that line will be left blank. We have our manuscripts, which are the original language manuscripts that are contained either in uh, the Iranian National Archives or in the British Library or, or elsewhere. And where possible, I've provided hyperlinks that open up directly onto the page itself. Um, and this can be seen uh, by giving, uh, by maybe looking at this first uh, at this first catalog entry. I can click on this and maybe uh, on, let it open up in the background because it takes a few seconds to load. But click on these three, uh, which is uh, a text from the INBA uh, collection uh, from a source cryptically denoted as KB, which is Ketal Khani Baha'i. Uh, and BN, which is the Bibliothèque Nationale in France. So while those are loading, I'll uh, continue talking about this. Following the manuscripts, uh, which will be some sort of handwritten text uh, held at a institutional library or university library, following that are the publications. And for in most cases, I include both where the full text of that item is, has been published somewhere in the original, as well as where extracts of it are published. Although for these major works like the, the Egon and the Actas, that's just too much work and, and, and with very little benefit to quote every place that's ever been quoted. Although that could be much more useful for more rare items. 
for items like Kitabi Actas, one sees listed first of all the the codes for the for the authorized translation, English translation of the Kitabi Actas here under translations and for the uh, original Arabic text of the Kitabi Actas under publications. And following are all of the uh, at least places where Shoghi Effendi has translated parts of the Kitabi Actas uh, and uh, here under translations uh, and, and where other pieces of the original text of the Actas can also be found in the original. Although really efforts were made to to pull together wherever Shoghi Effendi has translated all or part of, of, of these works of the central figures, but otherwise there's there's no guarantee that if an extract of a text has appeared somewhere that it would necessarily be in this in this catalog. So following the list of publications, list of translations, again all of these are, are clickable links, uh, and these clickable links will open onto the Baha'i Reference Library. So, uh, so clicking on World Order Baha'u'llah 109, that's page 109 in the in the published text, uh, this jumps you to uh, hopefully just about the correct paragraph in the um, in the Baha'i Reference Library, uh, so that you can see uh, at least the snippet of this uh, of this larger uh, of, of this major work of Baha'u'llah that is um, that was uh, that was translated and quoted in the World Order letters. So beyond then the this exhaustive uh, semi-exhaustive list of publications and, and translations, the first line. Uh, in English, we have uh, in English translation, uh, we have a, a field for notes, which is very spotty. Uh, it contains a few things. Uh, if, if this work was mentioned, for example, in Adib Tahir Zadeh's Revelation of Baha'u'llah series, there's often very useful introductions to these works of Baha'u'llah there. So I tried to link to all of those. Uh, there, things are mentioned in Baha'u'llah, King of Glory, and God Passes By, basically wherever major works are introduced in major texts that are uh, and, and narratives and histories that we have in English. I tried to include those, uh, and there's a few other sources, uh, say Journal of Baha'i Studies, other scholarly and academic works that deal with these texts are far less comprehensively represented at this at this time. Uh, but uh, an initial stab was was taken. This this project is really too too big for for one person to do um, in um, uh, with the appropriate degree of uh, of of comprehensiveness. Uh, I mentioned that there's hyperlinks throughout. Uh, and I should also mention again that this is intended really as a scholarly tool and it assumes acquaintance uh, in, in the acquaintance with the original languages would be would be most helpful in navigating this, although it certainly is possible to do it uh, with only uh, only being able to touch upon the, the English bits of it. So going running back, I've um, I've I've now hopefully downloaded these uh, these texts. Uh, and so this is an example of, you know, after, uh, uh, depending on how fast your internet connection is. So here's one text of the Kitabi Akdas in Arabic that was called up. This is the one at, at Kitab Khanei Baha'i. This is the one that's available at the uh, IMBA. Um, looks like this is in the hand of Janabi, Janabi Zain. Um, and, uh, whoops. So it j looks like just those two loaded up. Uh, there was another one at Bibliotech Nacional, which, which may be on a, on a slower connection. So what are some use cases for presenting all of this material in this way? One is if you have a reference and you want to know where it comes from, um, you can do look up from the source reference. And so for example, if you know, and if you know what the what the what the the code is. So if we know, for example, that I've coded gleanings as GWB, uh, probably not a big surprise. And you're interested, as people often are, they read a section of gleanings and they want to know, well, what tablet did this come from? Um, you can just do a search since PD, this is a searchable PDF. Uh, you can just do a search on, well, let's say I just read Gleanings 50 and I want to know what this came from. Uh, Gleanings 50 comes up as uh, an extract of this tablet, which happens to be the Lohe Saraj of Baha'u'llah, which is one of his longer works since it's numbered six in the sequence. Uh, that's what, uh, and, and then you see instantly, oh, Gleanings number 97 was also translated from that, uh, from that same tablet. So that's one use case. Another use case is, um, and for that you really need to know what those code abbreviations are. Um, you can look up words and phrases in the first line. So uh, let's say I'm interested in uh, tracking down that prayer, uh, unite the hearts of thy servants. Um, you can do a search and this works either in English or in, uh, or in Persian Arabic, uh, either way. And, you, and, and if it happens to be located in the, um, uh, in the, first, uh, in the first line, then that's a, a quick way of, of getting access to these. Uh, 
Also, um, another way of approaching this is to do a systematic read through. Start start at item one and read your way through, um, or better yet, start at the start at the back and read your way to the front, because it's ordered from short uh, longest to shortest. Uh, it may be more accessible to start with the shorter items and then work your way to the longer items, um, and so that might uh, that might be one way in uh, to this. Uh, and just to give an example, uh, I could start at the bibliography and then just head backwards. Um, and if you do that, then you'll find that um, you, you'll start with these very pithy uh, uh, statements, you know, a few words long uh, that were uh, recorded by Abdu'l-Bah. So the, the last item in the catalog is when they asked him, what is Satan? And he said, the insistent self. So a, th a three word extract. Uh, it's everything's estimated to, to 10 words, uh, plus or minus 10 words, and so that's why the shortest word count is going to be 10 words, but the shortest item in the catalog is Abdu'l-Bahá, uh, Abdu'l-Bahá's answer to, to, to what is Satan, uh, the answer being the, ins the insistent self. So that's one way of, of going through this, is, is just looking at from, from shortest to longest. Um, another way is to browse the titles, uh, since there's an index of titles, if you're interested in seeing what uh, is particular uh, titles of uh, of, of Baha'u'llah's works. For some reason, it keeps skipping the, the table of contents, and I have to go back. But um, I'm, I'm using my touch screen here, so just touching on 1362 brings me to the index of titles. Uh, the titles uh, from Shoghi Effendi's best-known works are, uh, are in bold, uh, and so you'll recognize those perhaps more readily, uh, although others you might also recognize that have been added to this. For example, the Bob's Address to the Letters of the Living is, is indexed as the first utterance of the Bob. Uh, I should mention that oral, reported oral statements, uh, sometimes referred to as pilgrim notes, but it's a category that goes beyond just pilgrim notes to, um, to uh, transcripts of talks and so forth, uh, are, uh, are indicated in the catalog with the additional letter U for utterance. So BBU would be utterances of the Bob, and the first utterance of the Bob, which is in this catalog, is his farewell address to the letters of the living, uh, for which we can find uh, we can click our way straight to the to the English um, uh, text of it, uh, or we can click our way to the available Persian text of it, which is published in Rasale uh, Ayame Tes A in uh, in Persian. Uh, and and so in some cases, I, I have notes on them. So a question was asked of the research department previously about what is the authenticity of this text. So I have a hyperlink. To the uh, to the research department's memo on that authenticity, which is found at bahailibrary.com. Um, again, these sorts of notes are are not comprehensive, but uh, and this is where feedback from people who who may use this catalog and find it useful will be helpful in filling in gaps. One can browse questions. I already mentioned that. One can also, if one is studying the, the original text and does not have a at hand a reliable published version of these original texts, then the catalog entries often contain multiple places where you can try to chase down a, uh, an, the original text, example being, uh, being here. And, uh, and if you don't trust any one of them, well, you have four different sources. So you can use these four sources as a starting point for your own collation of sources to try to get at the most reliable uh, text. Of course, if one really wants the answer to this question, one writes to the research department. But I, I hope that that one result of this won't be a flood of requests to the research department to, to uh, authorize texts. Uh, so, so that's the that's the catalog. And then just to to bring bring it out from the the question of the the contours of the ocean, the the coastline is what this is hopefully an an attempt to to present. Uh, the appendix of the uh, of this work presents an attempt at a, a little bit of a skim under the surface. Uh, which is a subject classification scheme, which uh, which may help in, in in navigating. It is, as with any kind of subject classification scheme, a very personal, a very subjective attempt to uh, to organize what is in there. And what I used as a, a framing set of questions were the same questions that Immanuel Kant used in his Critique of Pure Reason where he asked, well, what can reason do? Well, where, where can reason get us? Where can this kind of mental activity get us? And, uh, and he boiled it down to three main questions, which I don't think really have been approved on. 
uh, since this was written in the, in the 1700s. And the first question is, what can we know? The second is, what should we do about what it is that we know? Uh, and the third, the third question is, on the basis of the first two, what can we hope for? What, 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 um, what can we expect to happen as a result of, uh, of, of, of this uh, expression of what it is we know and, and what it is we ought to do on the basis of that knowledge? In terms of the Baha'i writings, this breaks out a little bit more. Uh, the question of what can we know breaks out a little bit more into questions of being and questions of knowledge. In traditional categories, academic categories, philosophical categories, it's the questions of metaphysics or theology, natural philosophy, uh, what is out there, uh, contrasted with questions of knowledge, epistemology, how, how do we know what we know? Uh, and very much, very much tied into that is the question of language. You know, what is the, what are the possible limits of language in expressing things that we know. And so what can we know breaks into what are the ultimate things to know about uh, and how do we know them? Uh, how does language function as a vehicle for the transmission of knowledge? And the writings have a huge amount to say about this, primarily the idea that language is symbolic, that in so many instances, language conveys truths that themselves are not fully expressible through the vocabulary and meanings of the individual words that comprise statements which is why symbolism is such a key feature of, uh, of any revealed text. Uh, it also happens to be a key feature of poetry and other modes, uh, we'll say non-revelatory modes uh, of language as well. And, and so there's a lot to be said about that uh, within the context of the Baha'i writings. So apart from what can we know, the next question that Kant asks is what should we do about that? And that again breaks into two subsections. What should we do about that individually? Uh, as, as individuals in relation to ourselves, in relation to others, in relation to what we regard as ultimate, ultimate significance, God, uh, the true one, uh, our, uh, the, the thing that we value the most. Um, and here we're, we're dipping into the realms of, of psychology, of, of personal ethics, uh, also of the mystical human individual mystical experience. And secondarily, questions of, of conduct in a collective sense, i.e. governance. So as groups of individuals that that exist in a world in which there is both cooperation and, and competition. How do we best organize ourselves? And here's where we touch upon questions of laws and ordinances, of prohibitions and admonitions, of social teachings and so forth. One can notice immediately an overlap between uh, all of these sections. For example, questions of individual contact, conduct cannot be uh, firewalled away from questions of social teachings and prohibitions and admonitions and so forth. Uh, I, I, I can only say in, in defense of, of this particular way of, of this particular lens of looking at it, uh, that the first section is more our, uh, our individual conduct as it relates to us as individuals, whereas the questions of governance in the next, uh, in, in the next section is more uh, it, when it does touch upon limitations uh, and, and strictures on individual contact, it's, it's more in the context of uh, us as, uh, as, as elements of a larger uh, collective entity. Uh, or a society or civilization. And then finally, Kant's third question was, what shall we hope? Uh, what, you know, what can we expect to happen uh, as a result of, uh, of these first two? Uh, in particular, um, uh, and, and I'm not talking primarily individually about the afterlife, which is more in, in the previous section uh, about the human soul and, and spiritual dimensions of, of human personality, but rather, what can we hope in the world? So on the basis of our coming together collectively, what kind of civilization are we going to build? And that's where we have the questions of the future world order, prophetic statements, and so forth. Um, but really, uh, what I put in this last section includes both past, present, and, and future. So it's really the historical contingency of, of our being in the world that is covered in that last section. So there are, as you can see, a, a, a schema of, of high-level subjects which are included here. And each of these is, again, clickable, uh, and it brings you to the subcategories. So for each of these main categories, of which there's a couple dozen of them, there are uh, several dozen subcategories. So just for the first main category of God and the realm of the divine will, which really encompasses a whole big chunk of theology, um, I have a number of subsections uh, about the Baha'i concept of God. Uh, the question of proof, proofs for God's existence, the question of the names and attributes of God and of the primal will and the, the word of God and the Holy Spirit and these different words that have been used to try to define and describe uh, realities which are all beyond the sensible and which in some way merge and fuse into each other as we see that 
the category of the primal will, uh, of which there's a great deal written about in the Baha'i writings, very much fuses into the category of the Word of God, which fuses into the category of the Holy Spirit. So although these uh, items can be represented separately, uh, they, they all uh, fold into each other. Each of these is clickable. And so going to the actual clickable map, um, if I'm interested in, say, looking at, um, at the, the idea that the names and attributes of God require the existence of objects, I can click on that. Uh, and each of these opens onto its own uh, compilation, mostly from the Baha'i writings, but often beyond, that, uh, that either support or add nuance to, and sometimes directly, sometimes directly contradict the, the subject title itself. But the idea is to provide as, as much as possible a sort of 360 degree view of, of what is, is there in, in the Baha'i writings on and around this particular topic. So the idea of the attributes of God requiring the existence of beings, which seems like a very technical philosophical point, there's actually a very large, you know, a fairly substantial compilation uh, of quotations from the Baha'i writings that say something similar to that. Um, this um, compilation here, uh, on the right-hand side, you'll see that there's a different hierarchy of uh, and a different thematic organization of the subject material here. Um, it's, uh, it, it is, uh, just think of it as a different way of organizing the same, uh, the same uh, pile of ideas. Uh, the, the first organization of it is, is, is here represented in the catalog, uh, and a second alternative way of looking at it, which is a little bit uh, less flattened, uh, and a little bit more based on, it, it's based overall on the structure of the ringstone symbol. Um, and it's from earlier work that, uh, an earlier personal project that I did more many years ago. Uh, and this more flattened version represents uh, a, a more recent version of it. Uh, so there are right, around, I think, 800 of these, uh, of these categories um, that are uh, subcategories that, that are found here, and all, all of which, uh, almost all of which lead to, uh, lead to another uh, quotation. So, you know, love as the, as the God's love for his own essence being the first of the four pathways of love. Um, you know, who, who knew there, there was so much written on, on such an obscure idea? But that's, that's all, uh, that's all uh, visible and available here. So uh, a bunch of reference points and, and I guess starting points for, for meaningful conversations for those who, who are interested in particular, uh, particular areas. So th this this particular subject classification scheme, I, I should say, is stronger when it comes to the more philosophical and metaphysical questions. It's comparably less strong when it comes to the more practical and pragmatic questions, although those are covered as well. So laws and ordinances are covered, um, but I, I would say I, I would be less confident in the um, in the comprehensiveness of, of of what follows if you click on on these uh, on these various uh, quotations. So I might have spent comparably less time uh, on asking the question, what do the writings have to say about uh, bribery, corruption, and fraud than I have about proofs for God's existence. But again, that's something which, depending on feedback, um, it's very easy to update the content. Uh, and so feedback on topic areas which may seem uh, rather underrepresented uh, will be gratefully received and uh, quickly wake, make itself into future uh, updated versions of this. All of which are available on the um, uh, on the the blog uh, which both is a place where you can find the uh, the inventory download the inventory uh, and also the outline itself is linkable from the same from the same website uh, which is where all of these quotations are found um, and uh, and there's a, a email you can you can use to offer any feedback on this. So uh, I've been going for around 45 minutes. That's probably more, that's more than I expected to, but hopefully that's enough of an introduction. This is I'm sure not the introduction you were expecting. Um, this is not a sort of here are the main works of Bahala and here's this, uh, a sample of them. I, th this presentation assumes that you've already done that. This this presentation assumes that. You, You've already read those books. You already have your bearings, and you're interested in going to the next level and, and diving deeper down. Uh, and what I hope this tool can do is give you the ability to uh, chart your own uh, path through this uh, through this most great ocean. So, with that, I turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Stephen. And I may not look like I'm vibrating with excitement, but I am. 
Um, I suppose the first question I would ask you um, is, this is a breakthrough, a, a historic breakthrough in access to the writings. Do you agree? Yeah. There are 24,000 tablets represented in this catalog. Um, and, and that's not including the three or 4,000 reported utterances, which is it one or two orders of magnitude beyond what, what, I mean, it was all, in a way it's historic, in a way it's not. I mean, all of the material that's, that's quoted and represented here mm -hmm. is available in the public domain. It's just a question of pulling all the threads together in one place. Right. Is the British Library material available online so that you can? It's not. So I should mention that um, because it's a, it's a major source for the writings of Baha'u'llah. As I mentioned, um, there's around 10,000 tablets uh, in that collection. It is not available online. Um, I was able to request it, um, and actually I have examples. I was able to request the images from the British Library itself, and they can be purchased. The images can be purchased by special request to the um, to the uh, uh, to, to the right email, which you can find on the British Library website, um, and um, and then uh, you have you have your own access to them. So it's um, it's around 15 gigabytes of black and white images, That's and amazing. you know tens of thousands of pages of writings. Where did um, they get them? So that's uh, there's a, a caveat lector on on this uh, because the the source of these texts. Uh, is the the family of of one of the family members the I think it was the great grandson of Mirza Musa, of Baha'u'llah's brother, uh, and these were not faithful to to Abdu'l Baha, uh, and so the the and as I mentioned in the in the bibliography on this entry, um, I think a special it's both exciting but also a note of caution should be sounded because the degree of fidelity of these texts to the originals has not yet been fully ascertained. Right. Um, I think if there's anything here uh, in terms of the, that might touch upon the the question of the uh, of Covenant the succession succession, then I would I would be extremely cautious. Otherwise, um, I would just have the normal amount of caution. But you know, with any handwritten texts, right? Presumably, they have no reason to corrupt a description of uh, God's essence, right, uh, and attributes. But but right. something about Abu Baha, they would be more inclined to uh, right. That's add right. a not to the text and that kind of thing. Right, but it's the same. It's the same set of questions that we have with the with the Princeton text as well, which have also been available for quite a while. Um, one, and, and that's why I and and this is mentioned I think in the introduction to the catalog. Another assumption for those who use this catalog uh, is that they have some exposure to the idea of so source criticism. Right. In other words, they don't read naively everything as, oh, these are Baha'i writings, or, you know, this is what so-and-so said, but they are able to look at a, at a source critically and say, well, this may or may not be authenticated, this is definitely not authenticated, this looks like a reported utterance from, you know, many years later, uh, and, and so one is really left to, to one's own judgment, good judgment, to weight the sources and, and weight the information that, that one has access to here. What fraction of the writings of Baha'u'llah do you have here online, accessible, clickable? Any percentage sense of uh, it? 75%, I think I said earlier, but, by word well, count. Well, but a lot of that is the British Library. How much of the... Ah, uh, yes. I mean, I, I mean... No, I would all. say about three quarters of that. Maybe, well, maybe less. I mean, the, I, think, I think around 4,000 of the 11,000 works that are here cataloged are only accessible in the British Library, mm. in the public domain. And so if you took the British Library set out, then, uh, then you, would, you would be down to around 7,000 works, or 7,500 works of Baha'u'llah, rather than 11,600. So it really is the, it's the single largest component. Um, and, and actually, I've, here, there's a, there's a table I have of the most frequently cited sources by author, which can give you a sense of of the weighting of things. So, for the Bob, which we are, which we discussed last time, far and away the most important single source was the IMBA, Iranian National Baha'i Archives, and then Princeton, Cambridge, 
um, oh. you know, because Gate of the Heart had so many extracts that mm. ended up coming in fourth. Uh, and the, the diamond here means primarily in English. Mm. For Bahá'u'lláh, the, the far and away, the most important source now is the British Library. Mm -hmm. And then the INBA texts. And, you know, over 5,000 tablets of Bahá'u'lláh in the INBA series. And then Asar uh, al Allah, which is a published series, uh, Asrar al-Asar, an uh, um, and then beyond that, La Ali al-Hikmat, and Ma'adeh mm Asamani, -hmm. Kitab Khaneh Baha'i, Ayat al which is a daily readings, but since it comes in two volumes and there's, you know, and there's, wow. you know, there's a lot there. For Abdu'l Baha also, the INBA series is still overall the most important one, the, the key, the key series. But I think the British Library now is, um, at least for Baha'u'llah, it, it does take precedence. And INBA is scanned and online. So if you click through, you can get to an INBA text through your, through your envelopes. Right. Yeah. yeah, the INBA texts are, are scanned and online. And they, um, they are all, uh, they're all clickable. So, um, and you said one quarter of all the writings of Baha'u'llah at this point are still only available in the research department at Haifa. Uh, that's right, by word count, that's right. By word count, right. Oh, that's amazing. But you got, have you um, identified all those tablets and given them numbers here as well? Are the, the, numbered ones? Tablets, the numbered tablets, the indexed numbered tablets, are these include the ones in, in only in Haifa or are they just the ones? No. No, no. So, okay. So, whatever's in Haifa is not at all considered or included in this study. Okay. Yeah. And so the the and these index numbers bear bear no reference to to whatever is in Haifa or whatever has been done in Haifa. Okay. That's it. Yeah. The idea was just to 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 to, to give a resource, really pri primarily to academics, uh, Baha'i scholars, those who really want to dig deep into the texts. Uh, and give them access to whatever it is you, you have access to now. Mm. Um, and this, uh, without having to make special appeals, although you, you, for the British Library, you, you would have to send an email yeah. uh, and, and, and purchase those texts, but they're not terribly expensive considering what, what you get from it. So this is an example of, of, of an IMBA text. Uh, and you can see it comes from the Afnan Library. So major thanks to Mujan Momin and those at yeah. the Afnan Library for scanning and making these available. The Afnan Library also has a number of other very, very useful and important things, uh, old um, periodicals and, uh, and other things that, that are the only existent online source for uh, a large, large number of, of other items that are in this catalog. Mm -hmm. So this The feed... download speed is a question. Oh, well, yeah. So this feeds into another so You may have to question. be a little patient. Go ahead. Uh, oh, that's it. Okay. Which feeds into another question I have, and that's that I think you've answered in a way, and that's that you didn't need World Center permission to do this because this is all publicly available material. Right. So that that's right. another very interesting um, aspect to this um, groundbreaking effort on your behalf, uh, and it is historic in that sense. I was going to ask the question, so in 2120, 100 years from now, would we have talks at the Association for Baha'i Studied with titles like Water Imagery and Baha'u'llah's Tablet 3,477, <laughs> 6,389, and 9,997? But I think the answer is we can have that now uh, and not 100 years from now, in a way, using the numbers that you've given the tablets. I mean, uh, the tablets were never numbered, and now you've given right. them numbers which may not be the permanent numbers but nevertheless definitely not the permanent numbers i mean it's really the the job of the world center yeah. i think to 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 make all these sorts of assignments in the long run right. so this should just be considered a very provisional effort pending uh pending the real effort that the with the, the research department can make with with its total access to to all the text to be able to present the um the you know the, the final ordering Right. But of course, if they spend too much time and they don't do it for 50 years, there's going to have to be an index comparing your system to their numbering system because people have used your numbering system so much yeah. that it'll, it otherwise will be useless without pe people being able to look up what the new system ha is. So that's another interesting um, example of how this is historic and groundbreaking, in my opinion, anyway. And, and I don't think I can thank you 
enough on behalf of many, many people who are drooling right now uh, uh, to have provided this absolutely amazing resource uh, to us. And it looks to me like you've just been finishing it up recently. I mean, the, the date there was February, in fact, was today, was yesterday. Yeah, I've been working. Yeah, he did before, but we should do that again, yeah. The... Yes, um, I've, this is, I've been rapidly iterating on it over the last several months. And um, uh, so definitely, yeah, th this last version, th the last few corrections and additions I made were yesterday. Um, and, but uh, it's set up in a way that rapid iteration is pretty easy. So, you know, the moment I start getting feedback, uh, oh, this link is broken, this thing points somewhere that's the wrong place or whatever, uh, or, or you missed a tablet. Uh, I'm excited to hear all of that because I'm a little obsessive about, about this uh, uh, project and about it being correct and as complete as possible. So I very much would, would like to hear feedback uh, as to whatever's been missed. And it can be very quickly added to, to future versions of it. Uh, and because there's a single point of reference online to get at it, uh, then uh, it makes it easy, uh, easier uh, to, I guess, propagate the, the, latest, uh, the latest copies. Mm -hmm. And we should assure everybody that, of course, this recording will be available on our YouTube site, and we will update the web talk page of Steve's talk where we can add the link to this uh, volume and uh, other, any other documents he provides us, including perhaps the slideshow. If, if the slideshow, since you were bopping back and forth between sure. different things, isn't yeah, really yeah useful yeah. but it might still be useful for people to some extent now you had mentioned the writings of Abu baha briefly here Can yeah you give us a summary about Abu baha and for example what fraction of Abu baha do you think is available now publicly i think you did say that i think you did say yeah that. it's around 40 percent, i think by by word count but substantially less by by item count um here's the first page of, of that catalog um i put the will and testament first um uh, although it's not the longest one, uh, and then everything beyond that is in order of length. So Memorials of the Faithful, Traveler's Narrative, Secret of Divine Civilization, three items we're all familiar with already in English. Uh, so the first four we're already well familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we quickly move into territory that those who haven't, I don't know, delved into provisional translations and so forth might not be so familiar with. Right. A thousand verses and com various commentaries on hadiths come next. Um, some answer questions is also in here 85 times because I, I logged each chapter separately. I didn't, oh. I didn't log the book as one item, uh, but each chapter separately. Um, I felt it was important enough to do that. Um, and so, for example, uh, some answer questions, chapter 11 ends up being, I think, the first entry in the catalog, but then they're scattered throughout. Hmm. Um, and, of course, you know, touching any one of these opens up the... Um, well, in the case, unfortunately, of the of the Persian text of some answer questions, it doesn't exist on the on, on the official website. website except as a as a uh, zipped file. Oh. So you can't really cleanly jump to it like you can with the English. You cleanly jump right to the to the text, uh, and that's not possible with the Persian text of some answer questions. Um, if there was a scanned version PDF of it somewhere online, then I might point to that because uh, one of the nice things about this is being able to to uh, to, to click on an item and to just jump straight there. Yeah. It also, by the way, works a little bit less well, but it also works on cell phone. And so wherever I am, um, it's only a 50 megabyte file. It, it easily you know, resides on your cell phone uh, and, and you can scan the PDF uh, and search it and do everything. Uh, click on the links. Uh, unfortunately, on, a, on my cell phone anyway, when I click on the links, it doesn't jump me to the right page. It jumps me to the top of the document, to the top of the PDF, but then I have to go that extra mile and uh, and find the right page if, if I'm looking and, for it. And flipping down through a, a cell phone uh, page, it might very well be a mile. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> uh, how long did this take you? Um, years. Uh, many years. Uh, I'm sure. Uh, more than ten thousand hours. More than what? 2, more than ten thousand hours. More than ten thousand hours. That's that would be five years at forty hours a week. Yeah, uh, just to, for people to compare. That's incredible. That's absolutely incredible, Steve. Um, I suppose we have some questions. Let me see if I can 
uh, see what questions we have. Where actually I can't get my um, my uh, uh, bar is covered up, so I can't actually see the questions because I can't access the. Maybe I can figure out how to click through by seeing parts of the thing. No, I don't want to do that. Um, I can't. Okay, that's not it. I can't. I think maybe this is chat. No, that's pause recording. Don't want to do that. Don't want to do that. Um, unfortunately, I can't pop up the questions because of the way my screen is set up. Uh, maybe I can. I don't know. Maybe if you can shrink yours down a little bit, it may move yours up enough so I can see them because I. I think you you can see them now. I I just opened a um. I opened oh, maybe it not, might not show up on my screen because it's. Uh, it has to do with the with the Zoom app, and maybe the Zoom app screens are automatically hidden even when I'm sharing my screen. Oh, now you've been muted. Or I've been muted. Well, I don't know how. Okay, now I should be all right. So we do have a few questions now. Um, Paul asks, do you know, do you happen to know Shoghi Effendi's source for the colophon or frontispiece quote that he placed at the beginning of the Kitab i Egan, usually in green ink in the older ed editions? The source for the colophon. That's what he asked, yes. I, I believe well, we stand in, in uh, yes. Uh, the story as related by Mr. Dunbar uh, is that that colophon was found written in the hand of Baha'u'llah in the original copy of the Kitab Igan, which made its way to the Holy Land in the, I, I suppose, 1940s or 50s, and was presented to Shoghi Effendi in the presence of Western pilgrims who saw him hold this precious text for the first time. Uh, and, and and look through it uh, and found in the margin of that text, which was, I believe, in the hand of Abdu'l-Baha, this copy of the Kitab i uh, they found this additional statement that was inserted by Baha'u'llah in his own hand in the margin. Uh, and Shoghi Effendi then took that and made that into the colophon of, of, of the Kitab i if, if I remember correctly. That's fascinating. Um, Perja says, I'm impressed. Uh, okay, I know you didn't do this to impress me or anyone else. It's just my shortcut way to say how much I appreciate what you presented today. Wow. I think that's uh, a good uh, summary, actually. Uh, Nima says, this is a wonderful source and labor of love. Thank you, dear Stephen. Do you plan on adding the same for the writings of Shoghi Effendi? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Shoghi Effendi is, uh, is represented heavily in the quotations from the um, uh, in the subject in, in the subject categories, but not in the in the catalog, uh, and that was partly for time constraints and and partly because I because Shoghi Effendi as being one of the twin pillars of of the of the of the world order according to the Will and Testament, I, I wouldn't want to add Shoghi Effendi without adding at the same time major letters of the House of Justice, uh -huh. and it just becomes such a large. Um, uh, plus, I think Shoghi Effendi's letters have been exhaustively collected and cataloged by someone online recently. Yeah, there's, um, yeah, I'm trying to think where I, that, that, I just saw a recent announcement about that. Yeah, many, many thousands, but they've already been, been pulled together for those who, who are interested. Related to that question, a sort of follow-up, have we any sense of the magnitude of writings written on behalf of the Universal House of Justice? The magnitude on behalf of the, like all the Department of Secretariat letters, they must turn out thousands a year. They must, yeah. I, I wouldn't have any idea what, what those numbers are. Yeah, I was curious about that because that's absolutely immense yeah. um, continuation. We actually don't have any other questions right now, but I suppose some more will, will pop up at some point. Actually, maybe we have some here. 
Um, Willis asks, is this blog approved by the House of Justice? It's a personal blog. No, it didn't. I, I don't think personal blogs re require approval. You're still working in Haifa periodically too, or working for the World Center, correct? Occasionally. Uh, I I still do do projects. Um, I, I'm not I'm not in the employer of the World Center. Right, but they would they would would not continue to employ you if they weren't satisfied. Is my point. So. So I think Willis Willis can be can rest assured that uh, they're not upset. Um, uh, that would be my guess anyway. Gela says, "How long did you spend putting the catalog together?" I think you've answered that. Um, Willis also asks, "Where does the AQA library originate from?" Um, well, there are several. There's seven or or eight volumes in Asar al Law, uh, which is all in. Arabic Tablets of Baha'u'llah, the first volume of which was published in Baha'u'llah's lifetime, and it went under the title Kitabi Mubin, and it was published in India in 1890, I think. Um, the, the second and subsequent volumes were published after the lifetime of Baha'u'llah, some during the lifetime of Abdu'l Baha and others, I think, up to the, I think, the 1960s. Uh, they're, in a, in a way, a, a, a bit of the backbone of Baha'u'llah's writings uh, that accessible to th those with uh, who, with knowledge of Arabic and Persian, uh, and uh, I mean, before the INBA volumes came out, I would say that that this series of Asar al Allah was would have been your your sort of main, you know, it, because it also contains most of the well-known works of Baha'u'llah. In in volumes three and four, it contains you know the Seven Valleys, and it contains the um, just uh, most of the works on that, on that, or a good number of the works on Shoghi Fendi's well-known list are in that series. Hmm. How many volumes does the Asar al-Qalam al have? Uh, I believe it has eight. Eight. Similarly, there's, a, there's you know, for Abdu'l Baha, there's a series of eight volumes of tablets of Abdu'l Baha, Makhatiba Abdu'l Baha, uh, actually runs to nine volumes. Mm -hmm. um, which is a bit of a parallel set, you know, published originally during the lifetime of Abdu'l Baha, and then later in the 50s and 60s in Iran. Um, and those, uh, all of all of those, of course, are subsumed in this in this catalog. Sure. Niam asks this question: What pearls did you find? I think that's her question. <laughs> uh, check the appendix. <laughs> so the the appendix is is my my attempt at bringing up the pearls and the and the list of the subcategories are the are those topic areas that stuck out to me as being of of significance um, and and the, the individual pearls of the of the passages favorite passages and so forth uh, would that would take too long to to go through I have internal and I don't think it's in the it, it, it's in the, uh, the the outline itself but I do have my own internal tagging system for for the pearls uh -huh. you know, the, my my personal favorites uh -huh. but uh but there are hundreds of those yes i'm sure i'm sure uh nima asks this question is there any documentary evidence to suggest that the british library collection comes from the contents of the two boxes of writings of baha'u'llah stolen by mirza muhammad ali and the covenant breakers after his ascension i noticed the sample you showed from the British Library is in Mirza Muhammad Ali's handwriting, and was just curious about that. Uh, yes, I believe that is. I believe that is correct. I don't have proof of that, but I think um, I think there's a very high likelihood, almost a certainty, that at least in part, the provenance of this collection uh, would be traceable to those two satchels of Baha'u'llah's personal papers that up until now have not been. Um, Recovered. The world. That's interesting. We still don't have the original Dawnbreakers that apparently was in those satchels, though. Yeah, and I mentioned that actually in the in the fairly lengthy source entry uh, on, on that series that um, that it's it's likely uh, at least in part the provenance of it. Hmm. That's interesting. Adib asks the new quote-unquote, Baha'i Reference Library has been live for five years now, but the Persian version still lacks the vast majority of the Persian language resources available on the old reference library. Is there any telling when the remaining material will be carried over 
to the new site. Your observation about the unavailability of the original text of some answered questions reminded me to ask this. And many thanks again for sharing your time, your knowledge, and this fantastically comprehensive inventory. Thanks. That's a great question. Um, and I don't know the answer, which is, uh, well, partly why the, the links in this catalog point more to that older version of the Baha'i Reference Library than the newer version, uh, at least when it comes to the original language text, because there's, there's vastly more in the old version of the Baha'i Reference Library than there is in the new version. Uh, there's a statement uh, at the top of the old reference library saying we're planning on shutting this down. Um, that statement's been there for years. Um, I hope they don't shut it down now because that would um, that would invalidate many thousands of links in this catalog. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, they they'll do what they need what they need to do to 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 bring the the writings into the best possible and most accurate possible form. Sure. Uh, let's see. Paul says the colophon quote you refer to is actually the one from the Dawnbreakers. The story for that is in the Hugo Jacari book. Ah, that's the one I was thinking of. Sorry. Uh, Adib then asks this other uh, comment, offers this comment, not a question. The huge compilation of Shogi Fendi's letters was put up by Don Calkins. That's correct. That's what I couldn't yeah. quite remember. Yeah. Uh, Roxana says this is a humbling and inspiring this is humbling and inspiring each of us to make use of our God-given talents for the glory of the cause and the loftiness of the station of his loved ones. Can't imagine what could be achieved if we were all to channel our talents and energy and dedicate over 10,000 hours to pursue a service to the cause. So you have inspired um, that as well. Thanks. Um, an anonymous attendee says, how could modern technology such, such as AI-based logarithms help us to revolutionize the study of the writing, such as by creating neural maps of themes, topics, key notions, semantics, etc.? Oh, there's a lot of ways. Um, and no, no one has even taken the first step into those waters. One would be um, to be able to create a, a web of interconnections where you look at one tablet and and you can see in I, I can imagine in my mind a sort of web of related tablets that you could then connect to and what connects one tablet to the other would be could be generated at least in part algorithmically on the basis of common words that are used uh, and that would help one uh, given a certain starting point navigate to other places that one otherwise might not have expected. So I, I can imagine something like that could be created as an exploratory tool. Um, at the same time, I don't imagine there'll ever be a, a real replacement for the hard work of reading and understanding it oneself and, and going through uh, essentially item by item and, and finding one's own notational system to highlight things that, that one finds um, that one finds significant. I mean, it's it's the nature of this body of work as it is you know, for, for any significant bo body of work, particularly sacred scriptures, that they can be read in so many different ways. Mm -hmm. uh, and their, their impact on the reader is so unique to that, to that reader's um, background and, and where they're coming from. And even any individual reader will get something completely different out of it, depending on when they read it, when in their, what, at what point in their life they read it. Yeah. Uh, and so the, 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 the idea that one, that there's that there's crystallized meaning in here that just needs to be mapped is i think not to to me the the, the a better way of looking at it is it's it's a dynamic flux you know it, there there's a there are there are meanings as bahala says there's 72 meanings behind every letter mm -hmm. uh, behind every word uh where are those meanings located you know are are they you know uh, are are they are they a function of the text itself or are they a function of the interaction between the reader and the text? Right. And if that's the case, which I believe it is, yeah. then, um, then any attempt to say outline it and say, well, here's the content is by its very nature going to fail when others try to, to take up that, that scheme that, that, that seemed to work so well for the one person because the meanings that are there are partly a function of what's in my own head. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I, that's how I understand, at least in part, this principle of the relativity of religious truth, which is so fundamental to the to the Baha'i faith. And, and that's in part also how I understand 
so many of Baha'u'llah's principal mystical works, like his Seven Valleys, where he talks about different realities being seen completely differently by different spiritual seekers who are at different stage of their journey. You know, some just tend to see things through the eye of distinction and others see things through the eye of unity. It's a fundamentally different modes of perception. Um, and reading through this and say outlining it or trying to extract content, looking through the eye of distinction, one is going to see a completely different set of truths, a completely different set of insights than uh, if one is, is looking at it through the, through the eye of unity. Mm -hmm. As, as an example. That brings up a, a related question in my mind, and that's, will this technology here, this huge compilation of the writings of Baha'u'llah and the ability to link back and forth, will that help us eventually in refining our translation norms? We have already a document showing how Shoghi Effendi translated words into English from the original Arabic and Persian. And I would think something like this, which would give us a much broader, maybe, well, I'm not sure if semantic range is quite the right word, but a broader range of text at any rate, textual range, whether that will help with uh, improving the translations. Well, since, since most of the things on this catalog are not translated, I mean, 90% or more, they, they may not feed directly or immediately, obviously, into improvement in, in translation work. I have no doubt that future iterations along the lines of what Google is already doing with Google Translate using neural networks uh, will enable us to at least very rapidly come up with reasonable first drafts, which, which currently we don't even have those. Mm -hmm. uh, just having a reasonable first draft would already be a major breakthrough. And I think that, um, I think that the technology of machine translation is what is, is advancing very rapidly. Perhaps I would say certainly to the point, you know, within our lifetimes, probably within the next few years of being able to do something like plugging in this massive corpus and, and getting something useful out, mm -hmm. certainly not something, not, not something eloquent or not, not something entirely correct, but, but something, something useful the first cut yeah. yeah farzad asks do we know if there's similar work being done at the world center what is the research department's main work at the moment apart from translation well i i can't i can't comment on that not not being a member of the research department now for the last six years um but uh, but i know that the, w whatever you see here the research department has uh you know has has much more of and, and 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 even even better organization and 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 more information. Right. I remember when I was on pilgrimage in '88, they were scanning all the original texts and uh, digitizing them so that things could be found and keyword searched yeah. in the original language. It was 30 years ago, so more than 30 years ago. Yeah. What so the research run has is, is vastly more than this. Yeah. Uh, Bavo makes an interesting comment. He says, six million words from Baha'u'llah, that's about 7.6 Bibles per central figure. So that's yes. a nice, nice way of thinking about it. Yes. Uh, Chela uh, says, I think this audience would love a quick intro to your Loom of Reality compilation, but I think you just did that and how you organized it. Yeah, I mean, I could say a, a, a little bit uh, more about it. The um, Loom of Reality compilation, which is the uh, on the right here, was originally inspired by the ringstone symbol. So, which is as we know has these three tiers of the realm of God, the realm of the primal will or the manifestation, and then the realm of creation. Um, and the realm of creation itself resolves, as Abdul Baha says, into arcs of ascent and descent, or roughly speaking, the processes of the material world and the processes of the spiritual world, although they really can't be separated. Um, and so, uh, and so that was the original I idea for the, for the organization of, of, uh, uh, of the outline as it's presented in Loom of Reality. So you have the realm of God and the realm of command, uh, the realm of creation, the arc of descent, and, the realm, and then the arc of ascent, which itself was broken into individual reality and collective reality. So there's a lot of similarity between this outline scheme and the and the flatter version that's represented in the um, in, in the catalog in the appendix of the catalog for me 
I navigate this one better because this just maps better onto how I have encountered the writings throughout my lifetime. And I've been working on this for 27 years. Um, so the first version of this was 27 years ago. Uh, but I've been continuing to, to actively uh, up, update it over the years. But I found when I've tried to share it with people, you know, it what maps onto my brain and, and, and usefully uh, others find uh, unnecessarily um, intricate. Uh, and so I tried to take the this scheme and flatten it um, so that it would be more accessible. Uh, and and the and, and that's how the uh, and that's how this subject classification scheme came to be, uh, was essentially trying to flatten it. Actually, the, my, my, my point of departure on this subject classification scheme was the, um, was the Astrophysical Journal, which is where I had published some of my, um, some of my physics work. Uh, and they had a uh, subject, uh, subject uh, scheme for topics in cosmology and astrophysics. Huh. Uh, and uh, and it was several pages like this, and the 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 formatting looked just like this, and um, and I found that an inspiring sort of first step in you know taking uh, a scientific field and how would you take a scientific field and break it into its main categories and subcategories, and so I used that as a template in creating this um, more flattened hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, a number of uh, also this was a number of years ago, but I've been trying to keep it um, more or less up to date. Um, as, as I continue in my own so personal reading and exploration of things. I remember getting a call from the late Lee Nelson back around 1992 or so. You might remember him from uh, the first collection of Baha'i writings in English that were scanned and digitized. And he was calling me saying he was trying to figure out a way to organize the writings so that you could click through on a topic and pop up the relevant passages just yeah. like this just like just this yeah but, it would have been before before the internet and hypertext i mean hypertext is a it's a divine creation yeah when it comes yeah. to this kind of a thing i mean yeah. it, it makes possible um the the representation of highly interconnected body of material that that before just could not have been represented yeah that's very true that's very true. So he was trying to do something like this, but he had not obviously gone anywhere nearly as far as this. I actually had sent him an outline that I had put together in the 80s, which is far less, far more primitive than anything like this mm -hmm. uh, as a starting point. I've never, I have no idea whether he ever was able to use it because he passed away not long after that. Uh, let's see. Uh, another anonymous relating, relating to the appendix. There is certainly a virtue in seeing the connections built up by someone else, such as yourself. But I can imagine a lot of the fruit of the efforts are yours because your mind did it. Can you comment on what you got out of actually putting together the categories? Um, a, a huge amount. I mean, it, 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 it influences every aspect of my life and being as, as a Baha'i uh, and, and how I present it to others. Um, starting with just having a having a framework to hang things on is a huge aid to memory just, yep. so just pragmatically you know it's much easier to remember a quotation if if it's situated in a context yep. and the context is provided by the by the outline um, so that that's number one um, a, a second huge um, benefit of it is by categorizing things and putting things into bins which is you know really what this is one sees things side by side that otherwise one would never see side by side right and oftentimes the things that end up lying side by side are contrasting or complementing or interacting with each other in such a way that it catalyzes you to think about things in a different way mm -hmm. it allows you to see three-dimensionally mm -hmm. you know Whereas before, it, you're only looking at one or the other. Uh, and so, uh, and, and these two things may, you know, these two quotes may, may be, may on the surface appear to say opposite things. And until you see them side by side, you say, hold on, is this a contradiction? Or is this an example of a, of a three-dimensionality? Or is this an example of, a, of, of, of the fact that seen through a particular lens, certain statements can be true? And other statements can be false, mm -hmm. but seen through a different lens, 
the, the, the order of truth and falsehood reverses. Yeah. Uh, that's one of the features, I think, of the, of the text, you know, the capital T text, that only becomes apparent in doing this kind of work, because, because it's only when you drill down on a particular topic uh, and are able to pull everything on that topic together in one place that you can really start to see those, that three-dimensionality of it. Right. It reminds me of, a, I think it's a statement by the Guardian secretary about how two comments in the writings may be poles apart, but if you can see the sphere that connects yeah. them together, you can understand how they relate. It's like the meridian lines are there, but they're not always visible because you don't, you don't have all the context. And even, of course, even what's represented here, although there's 6,000 quotations here or so, um, is just a fraction of what's out there. So it, it's, there, there's, um, there's so many more meridian lines yet to be drawn. Mm -hmm. um, and to extend the metaphor of the ocean, I mean, there's, there's still undiscovered continents. I mean, yeah. we're, we're still at this early stage of mapping the coastline, and we don't even know what's, what's all out there in, in the middle of that ocean. Yeah, that's true. But at least we now have a better sense of what's there with this particular source, because I had no idea that three-quarters of the writings of Baha'u'llah potentially were available mm -hmm. already to the public. I yeah. had always was under the impression that we had, you know, five to ten percent in English and probably twice that available through published Persian and Arabic sources. Yeah. So that's really quite an amazing, uh, an amazing change in the situation. Yeah. Um, what is in your next step with this particular project, do you think? Just continuing to update it and expand it? Continuing to update it. Um, it, it depends a lot on, on feedback. Um, I, I hope that, that, well, the next logical thing to do is, um, is to pull together the texts because this is pointing in, in 24,000 different directions or ta double that if there's, if there's a translation uh, to different places on the internet. Uh, it would take some intrepid uh, pioneer of the ocean to go through each of these items uh, and extract the text. In many cases, it would have to be typed because these are page images from manuscripts and there are no typed versions of it in the public domain. So, um, you know, th the next logical organizational thing to do would be to pull together all the Arabic and Persian in, in one master file and, and all the English in, in another master file so that it's there in a, in a search, so that the entire text then becomes searchable. I won't be doing that. Yeah. We have a lot of long texts by Baha'u'llah, of course, that have been translated, and some long ones we don't have. But I don't really have a sense for what the short tablets by Baha'u'llah were like. Are a lot of them intimate and direct and personal to people? Are a lot of them prayers? Yeah, most of them are encouragement, various forms of encouragement, <laughs> prayers, acknowledgement of contributions. There's a lot of transactional, uh, transactional tablets. A reference to individual people, send my greetings to so-and-so. There's a lot of that. It's the water of the ocean. I mean, the, the metaphor is perfect. I mean, the revelation is an ocean, and we are supposed to look for the pearls. Well, what that means is most of it is ocean water. Yeah. So it's all life-giving, but it's ocean water. You know, every drop looks similar to every other drop. Uh, and, and most of the ocean of Baha'u'llah's revelation is various forms of, of encouragement. That's about all the questions that we have. I don't see any others, and we have now been going for about 90 minutes, so this might be a good time to wrap this up. Right. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for this really fascinating period of, of discussion, uh, and I'm sure we'll have, you know, a lot of people will benefit from this, and I hope you get a lot of feedback, because that, of course, is the thing, as you said, that will push things forward. I do actually see someone has raised their hand with a question, I guess. Um, actually, there's now I've got a couple of other questions here. Um, well, what would you consider adding a feature to identify scribes of various manuscript sources? Um, probably not, because, I mean, if one gets to that level, then one, one is led to the fact that the World Center has 
vastly better resources when it comes to the original texts. In most cases, you know, for every one text you see quoted here, there are several texts at the World Center of equal or greater reliability in the hand of Janabi Zain, in the hand of Mirza Arajan, Bahá'u'lláh's uh, amanuensis. Uh, and, the, and those are really the ones, it, if, you're, if you're at that level of, uh, of study where you really want to know who the scribe is, then you're also going to want to know what texts there are at the World Center. Uh, because those would be the ones that that would all that would take precedence in, in this kind of uh, in that kind of study. What sure. what uh, what I would add before scribes are the dates, because uh, yeah. there's a lot of date information that uh, that's not included here, uh, and oftentimes the dates of the tablets are are published, and those could be included as a, as a separate field. But that Company. would be. It. How many of these tablets actually have a, a date mentioned in them or presumably yeah. at, at the top or is it mentioned yeah. in the text? Oftentimes it's mentioned at the top or in the sig signature line or in the text or in uh, in ancillary material that has that has dated it. Mm -hmm. But d doing adding that would be a whole a whole separate research project. Absolutely. How, do you have you any sense of what fraction of the tablets are undated versus dated? Um, most of them are well, of of Baha'u'llah's writings, uh, probably probably less than half have dates all the way to the to the day. Mm -hmm. uh, although most of them can be dated to the year by comparison with other manuscripts. Um, I should say, actually, in terms of dating, uh, the the one place in this catalog where you do have the dates is, are the utterances of Abdu'l Baha. So there are three or four thousand records of these reported utterances, talks, pilgrim notes, and so forth. In most cases, there we have not only the day, but who, but a bit of the context. You know where Abdul Baha was, who he was speaking to, um, and I tried to capture some of that in the catalog entries. Um, and so, if if you go to the um, to those uh, to, to those entries, you'll you'll often see um, a sort of a when and a who. Mm -hmm. So you know, words spoken on such and such a day in this, in you know, an, in answer to certain questions, from, you know, sometimes from so and so. Mm -hmm. to his entourage, maybe, you know, to the editor of the police journal spoken on that day. Mm -hmm. uh, it's you know, a little bit paradoxical that, you know, that category uh, of the catalog, which is least authentic in, in terms of, you know, th these are oral statements, uh, is, is, is the section where, where we have the most detailed information uh, uh, in terms of the where and the when. We have several people thanking you for planning to come to the Danish and Swedish summer schools this year. So it was Danish, seem, not Swedish, Danish, not this Swedish, year. Sweden, huh? Uh, the Danish, but not the Swedish this Swedish year. Swedish was last year, I guess. Uh, a few years so, ago. Uh, a few years back. So if anyone wants to hear Stephen and they're in Europe, they'll have to plan on going to the Danish summer school. Come to Copenhagen. Yeah. Uh, Stephen July. Fantastic. Early August. Beautiful yeah. time to be in Copenhagen too. Well, thank you very much, Stephen. This is just absolutely amazing and incredible. And, um, we will, like I said, be forever in your debt for this, and I do hope you get a lot of feedback from people so that this project can continue to move forward.